should have done this. Conchola. Conchola. Would you like to tell his credentials? No, no, no. Yeah. Okay. Jesse is a wonderful man. Uh, and he, he has been, uh, let's see, he came uh, 2001 on the board. Yeah. I have, let me tell you, I must tell them about how we met. Oh, that's good. Jesse is a statistician, and um, his wife is also a statistician, and uh, he works on PowerPoints. You know, Allison is her name. <laughs> and he, we both worked on this, but can you imagine the memory that this takes to send to somebody? You know, collage three people, three pictures in each slide. Yeah, it's amazing. Um, anyway, he, um, his children go to All Saints School, went to All Saints School. Now, two, one of them is in the, the high school now. And he works, you know, to, to be to have a child in a Catholic school. Number one, you got to pay, huh? and number two, you have to give service. So he was giving his service uh, at the festival. We have an annual festival, like I'm sure you do, um, to collect funds for the school. And he was in his booth, and I was walking by, and I looked at him, and I said. Um, uh, I wanted to talk to you. I said, I want to talk to you. What's your name? And he told me. And I said, um, are you from here? And you, you told me you were from Santa Maria, right? Or, mm -hmm. That's where you live, isn't it? And, and then I said, um, I asked, well, where do your parents come from? Because he looks Hispanic, you know? Where, where do your parents come from? And he said, um, well... My mother, or you asked me, I can't remember which asked. Because you asked me. I did. Okay. <laughs> and he said his father came from the state of Guanajuato, and his mother came from the state of Chihuahua. And I said, well, isn't that strange? My father was born in Guanajuato, in Benjamo, uh -huh, Guanajuato. That's right. And my mother was born in Chihuahua. In Santa Rosalia de Tamaro, Chihuahua. Right. Ciudad Tamaro now. <laughs> so, but that really kind of cemented this friendship together. And then I, I said to him, Would you like to join the LACA board? I'm always looking for board members. <laughs> and he says, Well, I don't know. Tell me about it. And you got interested. So he joined. Two old people. <laughs> yeah. And now he's been president for two years. Mm -hmm. Hopefully going on three. Wow. Well, we'll see. <laughs> and he's a great asset. He's a, he's a hard worker, and he, I think he puts everything into what he does, you know, 100%. So, thank you so much. Oh, thank you, Carmen. Thank you. Well, we have, we have some questions, or we'll entertain some more, but I get to ask the first one. Oh, good. <laughs> You go, you go way back into San Francisco for your nursing training. Yes. Uh, we'd like to know how you got inspired to be a nurse in the first place. Oh. And then, tell us a little bit about how this school manages to put out remarkable women like you and like Sylvia Canetta. Mm -hmm. She graduated there about after, 15 years after. After I did. Go ahead. <laughs> um, <laughs> How you got inspired to be a nurse to go to school? What's the school about? <laughs> okay, learn about my family here. Uh, my mother uh, and father, uh, they met in San Francisco, but they came in the 1920s when the, the border was open, wide open border. So they came in. I must tell you about my father, because that's interesting. He came with his uh, uncle, who had been traveling back and forth. And, of course, my father didn't speak English. And it was during the revolution, and he had to get out, and he needed a job, or new jobs there. And uh, the uh, custom man asked uh, the uncle, because my father didn't speak English, um, is he a tourist or a student? 
And uh, so the uncle said to my dad, tell them you're a tourist, because if you're a student, they're going to charge you 25 cents for registering you. <laughs> <laughs> so poor dad, well, you know, he came in. And so he had a heck of a time getting his, his citizenship until my mother then became a citizen and then he did. Um, so that's, that's my background. And, um, and so my mother, my mother lived in the city in San Francisco. And, and kind of, she came when she was 16. Dad came when he was 20, just turned 21. And they met at uh, a funeral. <laughs> a nice place to be. Um, but she always wanted to be a nurse. But she didn't have the background. Uh, in Mexico, you know, you're lucky to get a primary education. They had a primary education. And, and at, in those days at St. Joseph's, uh, the nurses actually slept with the patients in the same room. You know, to take care of them 24 hours a day. Yeah. I mean, it was really bedside nursing. Yes. Yeah. And, and St. Really. Joe was known for their bedside nursing. Um, and then, of course, people went to college and, and they learned the theory. Well, we had the theory, you know, but, um, but St. Joe produced a lot of bedside nurses. Um, so uh, it was my mother's inspiration. My mother, I would ask my mom, how come you didn't finish? And she said it was too hard. She didn't, she didn't have the background. So I think she inspired me. And unfortunately, she died before I graduated from nursing school. And, um, and I went on to school. You know, and I, I know my dad's very proud of my accomplishments. Um, but uh, it was kind of a, a bittersweet thing for me that mom died before she could see that I graduated from nursing school, which she couldn't do. I fulfilled her wish. No. So that's my story. And how does the school manage to put out people like you and <laughs> well, Panetta? And, and so yeah. Um, well, my first answer was discipline. We had a lot of yes. discipline. And, um, and of course, it was a Catholic hospital and Catholic nuns, and um, they they stress service, mm -hmm. you know, and you serve mankind. You serve by being a nurse, you know, but you sometimes go the extra mile. So and that was a culture. It's a culture too. Mm -hmm. Thank it's you. A culture. And my mother was very. My mother was. She learned English. And she always, if, if there was a neighbor that needed to go down, uh, that needed an interpreter, she would drop everything and go so that they could get, and in those days, you know, it was depression, and uh, to get money to live on or whatever. But she, uh, uh, she was always helping people. So she was my mom. Marita. Well, here's my question for later. Okay. Uh, I, I don't want to take away from the, the remarkable achievements of this woman, oh. but I couldn't help but tell this family about my husband, who just died five months ago, yeah. developing something called the Fisher Model Privy. Okay. Uh, Fisher, Fisher Model, model Privy. Okay. In our house or latrine. Or right. whatever. Her husband, my husband. husband and I were directors of a Quaker work camp Ooh. in Nairi, Mexico, uh -huh. 60 years ago. Oh, yeah. And the Quakers had their work campers building what we used to call the, the Roosevelt style privy, which was a wooden thing with a little moon in the back. Oh, yeah. 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 All wood, the seats wood, everything wood. Well, Glenn, being a um, sociologist, cultural anthropologist, etc., on his way to being that, said, that won't work in this community. They don't have enough wood uh, to build on these things. So he developed a frame that you, you put on the ground of cement with cement seats. And then you could build whatever you want to around it. You could plant bamboo, you could put cinder, cinder block, or whatever else. 
This became known as the Fisher Model Privy. <laughs> Adopted by the state of Veracruz as the official privy. And I think by now, looking at the pictures that I see of them here, I bet a lot of them were cement based. Yes, wood they based. Um, they, had, they had cinder blocks around them or yes. whatever, because these countries don't have that wood. And you didn't have to have it be the Roosevelt style. So uh -huh. I love that. I was just wanted to tell you about because you showed so many pictures of the trees. That's a tree. I can tell you what the tree is. And when Glenn and I went back to visit Mexico to see how things are going, you see, he was part of a directed culture change in development run by the Mexican government. We went back and snuck around in some of the village toilets. Sure enough. They have cement faces. So. <laughs> <laughs> and her name is Alina Fisher. <laughs> Thank you very much. Oh, that's wonderful. There's a, a question here. What exactly does LACA stand for? Oh, Latin America Community Assistance. It was kind of interesting. Uh, well, you might want this to is the rest of the question you can answer to a lot of is it affiliated with the church? No. And we, we write that down in our newsletter. You'll see, it's a, is it affiliated with any church? If so, is there also religious training? No, none of that. Um, no. And so your volunteers come from a variety of places put it into? And we would see anybody, you know. And in Latin America, some places are 80% Catholic, some are Protestant. We see everybody. No, there's none of that. There was another LACA related one here. Let me see. Is the LACA associated with other organizations in the area? Well, we partner. And, and it's a good thing. You know, we partner with the Lions Club mm -hmm. for the site. We partner with the Rotary Club uh, for the, um, the solar cookers. Um, we partner uh, for the eye clinic. Lions with insight. So, and I often talk at Rotary meetings. They ask me to come in. That's interesting because sometimes they don't have a a, a speaker for that week, so they can call. Me. So I fill in. I fill in about lack of what we're doing. You want to know what's lack of doing? Um. This next one is lack of related. How is it funded? It's funded mostly by donors. We, uh, Donors, we have received um, one grant from uh, Peter Lynch. Anyone remember Peter Lynch, mm -hmm. uh, the guru of um, uh, Magellan Fund? Uh, mm -hmm. um, well, Peter Lynch uh, retired. Uh, this is kind of aside from this, but just to give you some background, uh, he retired. He uh, retired when he was in his early 40s because his father had died of a heart attack in his early 40s, and he didn't want to do that. So he retired, and I guess he became a consultant, whatever they do at, at Fidelity. And I, I tried to call, I, I wanted to do a grant. This was kind of early on. And, um, and I've never done, I've never written a grant. So um, someone back there in Boston told me that Peter Lynch had just established a nonprofit uh, for other nonprofits or whatever. And then he, you know, he was Catholic, and so he established another fund, he had a lot of money, for Boston, the Church of Boston. He was just managing the money. And so um, I wrote for the papers, and I, I wrote a grant. Well, I had a friend that, um, and this is another source grant, I'm not going to push. Um, and I had a friend that, that was a good editor, and he, he, I thought I did a great job on this grant. And it came back with, well, you know, the teachers, with all these red marks. And, <laughs> and, I, and I was deflated. Actually, I wasn't because I wanted to help. And so I did it again. And uh, I think I asked for 20000 And I did it again, and it was a little better. There were less red marks. <laughs> The third time it passed, but I got my money. Yeah, I did get the money. Great. 
I don't know what we need to do. But that, that's perseverance. But we need a grant writer, you know, for really deep. Mm -hmm. uh, normally, excuse me. So it comes from, if we get grants, it comes from our, our donors. It comes also from events and fundraising. And incidentally, <laughs> we are having a fundraiser. I don't know if anybody wants to go to Hayward. We're having a fundraiser on the 15th of October, and it's called, it's a chili fundraiser, and it's called Chili Con Laca. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll have some dancing afterwards. Where is it? Where? It's going to be at All Saints Church. They have a brand new gym, and it's all been refurbished, and it's going to be in the gym, and we'll have people will be tasting numerous um, different types of chili and um, and we have lots of things that we're going to wrap off the prizes for people to win and we're going to have a dance afterwards uh, for ten dollars ten dollars an adult it's worth the trip ten dollars hey we ten dollars uh, and if you want to know more <coughs> it's in the newsletter and it's also online if you go to lakafoundation.org it will be available it yeah. starts at 5 what is in here so this is the night. Yeah, that's an old one but it's last year yeah, so last yeah. Um, but it starts at 5 you get home before it gets dark <laughs> there's a question here does the governments of these countries cooperate with Laka and I would say how do they cooperate Yes. Well, the the um, the only thing is we don't give them money. Um, for instance, for the water projects, uh, that's taken care of by the people that are in charge of in the community. You know. um, but for instance, the what we see, see Lapa, uh, transporting students, that came from the mayor and asked us if he would do that, and then he took over. After that, we've had some very good relationships with the mayors of these small communities. Um, and actually, uh, when we um, sponsor or, or build uh, wells, they provide the engineer to find the water. We don't do that. successful in getting service organizations to sponsor projects, and how do you do it? <laughs> I'm a great talker. <laughs> As some people say, they can't say no to Lil. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so I've taken a lot of no's, but uh, I have developed an, an elevator presentation. You've heard about that, haven't you? In which the time it takes to get to one floor, you've already convinced them about, you know, how okay. good you are. And, uh, by the way, another way we gain money is we have this culture within the board. I developed a culture. And that is that everyone puts their money where their mouth is. If they're a board member, they should support the board with their own money. And we don't have a quota, but we ask people, to put in what they could afford every year to um, pledge to the board. And I keep telling people, if everybody pledges, we won't need fundraisers. By the way, how much of the money is for administration, though? Oh, that's good to know. Good to know. 96% of our money goes to direct services. No one, I don't know of anyone that can say that. 4% goes to this newsletter and a postage, and our mailbox. Mm -hmm. And the website. Mm -hmm. website. No, Actually, I, I pay for it. Website. It's a donation from me. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. That's the explanation for why you can do it that way is because you have so many volunteers. Yes, we have volunteers too. The board is a working board, and when we have a fundraiser, everybody's out there. You know, and selling tickets, it's a little more difficult selling tickets. Some people don't like to sell tickets. But, um, and some people don't like to promote. You know, they're not outgoing. You know, they don't want to uh, ask them because they're afraid of a no. And I'm not afraid of a no. You know? She's not afraid of a no. <laughs> I'm not afraid of people saying no, no, no. But, 
Because you know, I know that most people will contribute, you know. There's just, uh, like my choir. <laughs> I said, we're having a fundraiser. Now, if you can't go, can you contribute? <laughs> Yeah. And, and they do. Yeah. There's a question here about, um, do you include engineers and, and those types of people in the designing and building of water and sewer facilities and housing? Um, you mean local? Well, either, I suppose. Do you, how do you do that? Do you bring people up with you to get started? We'd like to. We'd like to. We had a board member that was uh, in construction and he was willing to go, but it, somehow it didn't, it didn't work. Oh. Um, we have, um, we don't have any, I'd love to have an engineer on the board, you know. Mm -hmm. We should work on that. Yeah. Try to get an engineer and, and he would go. Yeah. <clears throat> because uh, one of our board members, you know, the, the, uh, he uh, is a contractor, he does bids, you know, but he's retired now. And I think his health is a, to the point where he can't go. But, I would have liked to take them to Haiti and to look into those wells to see if they were feasible. I have two two questions about Haiti here. In Haiti, do you coordinate with other organizations like Doctors Without Borders or Red Cross? I'd love to. Uh, I'd love to. Uh, Doctors Without Borders has their own organization. I don't think they partner with anyone, uh, even though I've supported them. Uh, I, I don't think they do. And they're also based in Haiti, which is nice. There's another organization called uh, Partners in Progress. Partners in, in Health. Do you know that one? That, uh, you're aware of, um, uh, who's the doctor? What's his name? Paul Farmer. Yes. He's the founder of that. He's renowned. There's a book called uh, Mountains Beyond Mountains. You should read it. Oh, yeah. Have you read it? I've heard of it. Yeah. It's a marvelous book. It's about his story and what he's done. Uh, went to Harvard and, you know, took courses whenever he could and came back to Haiti and married a Haitian as a child. And he, he has worked to improve the lives of the Haitians. He's Paul Farmer. And I understand that he was nominated one year for the Nobel Prize Award. Mm -hmm. uh, he should have gotten it. He's, he's, a, he's a great man. I've never met him. But, um, but they're they're pretty uh, individual you know, these mm -hmm. these organizations. It's hard it's hard to partner with. I mean, they're bigger than we are. Yes. Well, there's a question here. Worldwide, a lot of money was collected for Haiti. If you divide that money by the population number, it comes to a lot per person. It does what is needed besides money, and how do you use the money more wisely? What is needed is a decent government. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Haiti, Haiti, Haiti has been ruled by the French. Mm -hmm. And in, in the history of Haiti, um, they had to pay a large sum to France, which they were paying out of debt, to get out of debt. And um, also, uh, we, the Americans, were responsible. We had the military in, we had the the, um, and that's real political now, you want me to talk about oh, this? Yes. Um, and, um, and the, the elected um, representative, elected by the people, um, his name, uh, French, what's his name, he was elected, and he was taken out by Americans. Duvalier? Or no? Aristide? Uh, Is it uh, Aristide or? Aristide. Yeah. Aristide. 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 Yeah. Aristide. 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 <laughs> exactly. And he was duly elected by the people. And he was shipped to uh, Dominican Republic, which is on the island of this, this, this island. Well, his supporters brought him back. Mm -hmm. And he was again shipped to Africa where he taught for a long time. Now, I understand he came back, and it's low-key, nothing's happened. But he supported the poor, and um, uh, I read his book, and then there's other books that say he didn't, you know, the con contrary. Mm -hmm. But I think a lot of the, the occupation, like for instance now, the UN, 
is in there. Why should the UN stay there? I mean, there's 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 no violence or anything right now, and they have UN. And some people claim that the the people from Nepal are not police brought in cholera with them when they came. There's some claim of that. There's no real evidence to prove it. And I, I understand that the um, uh, uh, organizations that test, I know that the, the uh, CDC uh, sent experts over to test the, the um, type of uh, cholera, and they did find that that cholera was endemic in Nepal. But they can't prove it. They can't prove it. And um, it's the people that suffer, you know. That's who we try to help. But it's the governments that have, and it's other governments. The French government, our government. I have two more questions. This I don't know, does that answer it? Mm -hmm. You know who I'm in sympathy with. <laughs> this next one kind of dovetails in. How do you decide which cities to help? We get requests. We don't go into a place unless they ask us. Like in Latin America, uh, in Honduras, that's where we focused originally, and we stayed there a long time. Uh, but the people ask. They know we're doing water projects. They know we're sponsoring students, schools. Um, so they, they know about us. And so they contact us. So most of it is a request of them to you, and then your Or referrals to to that person to oh. contact us. <laughs> You must so have a very fluid feel. budget to be able to <laughs> decide where to go well, next and how much to spend. Well, it's amazing. You know, it's amazing. Uh, uh, when Hurricane Mitch struck, um, we had some people, missionaries, that we knew there. And I called and I said, what do you mean? And she said, um, actually it was very difficult to get because they had to crack phones or something. You know, everything was down. And um, she said, you know, there are bodies that are going down the river here. Yeah. Oh, it was tragic. It was just tragic. And uh, people were, remember that woman that was on the rooftop that for days they couldn't get to her? Um, and, and here it was like Haiti, you know, the poorest of the poor. Um, and, and so uh, I said, what, what do you need? And she said, we need money. We need to get money to us because we need to provide water, shelter, uh, food for these people. And so our budget, this is before we had uh, a big uh, board. You know, this is when we, could, we did things very quickly. <laughs> and, and so um, we had, I think we had $50,000 in our budget. And we sent 25, half of it, we sent. And it comes back, you know. Um, By the way, did the airlines um, contribute something? I tried, it. yeah. You know, one time, we were very fortunate with Continental. And Continental goes into, uh, uh, Continental, yeah, I think Continental at one time, in, yes, into Honduras, it was a guy and we did get uh, tickets from them. We applied for them. And that was before they didn't have any money or something. You know how airlines go up and down in terms of funds. And um, so it was just for a while. We tried to get uh, um, that, little, that local one, uh, Southwest. Southwest Airlines, you know, mm -hmm. but we couldn't get We tried for the funders, we tried to get tickets, but there's a way. So um, they have got some, you know, Continental's been very good. Good. Well, I have one last question. Until they get here. Yeah. Do well, you have one? I have a question. Uh, this question goes back to the um, Gilroy area. And oh. To migrant camps yeah, in the United there, States. Yeah. And it says, what is the situation of U.S. migrant camps? Do they still exist? Gee, I don't know. I haven't worked since we worked in Gilroy. I haven't. Uh, I haven't. It was pretty bad in those days. I, I can tell you they still do. They've all been It's what? They still do exist. 
But I was lucky to enlist a pediatrician, and she came down. She was Hispanic, too. And she came down. Uh, she worked at, um, what's the hospital in Gilroy? It, it, well, it's, it's actually, it's a satellite. Yes. Of, um, it's a satellite of the one in uh, San Jose. Uh, the big one in San Jose. Oh, Valley Medical. Valley, it was a satellite. Uh, and then they, have, they sent a doctor um, to the clinic that, that was there. Uh -huh. And then I, I would choose from Peru, I remember. And so I kind of uh, <laughs> com uh, confiscated her time. And I said, could you come earlier and then see the, see the kids in the camp? And she did. She brought medicines and we had one new case, it was so sad. And it was a baby, and the baby had an extremely low um, red cap, you know. And, um, and she wanted to, she referred the baby, the mother, to Valley General in San Jose. And um, the mother was afraid because the mother thought that they would be sent home. So she didn't. And they left. And they took the baby with them back to Mexico. Mm -hmm. And we called, I can't tell you how many places we called the doctor, and I called like the border patrol hospitals there and the border and every place. Well, next year, they came back with a healthy baby. They mm -hmm. found somebody, they found the doctor. They did. Oh, I didn't know that story. Yeah. That's great. Uh, a healthy baby. A year older. <laughs> <laughs> Any other burning questions? I want to make a reference to Cuba, and I know this on the map that you don't have Cuba, um, the, the, the name of the country on the map. And it's probably because you don't do your services there. Oh, but I was so curious. It's, it's indicated that we're there, though, isn't it? There's a star or arrow or something. How is it? Um, no. It just doesn't say Cuba no. on the map, but I, I, it doesn't no. matter about that. But I just wondered um, what your association with the Cuban government has been like. 